So now I want to talk a minute about how did these idols at the Jordan become attractive to me? You know, I thought I could do a message on every idol, major thing, where I was brought to the Jordan, brought to an end of myself, and then seeing that Christ is the way, but then somehow being convinced that to get him was not by the blood of Jesus, but by some method. And then you've got another Jesus. If the Jesus Christ that you are pursuing is not the Shekinah glory, the spirit of Christ that dwells in your spirit in the Holy of Holies, available only by the blood of Jesus Christ to those who are ungodly but work not but believe and are reckoned as righteous because of their faith, then you've got another Jesus. Period. Okay? Uh, and an idol is a substitute for Christ. Idolatry and the spirit of Antichrist go together. And when I did the Thyatira message, I talked about another spirit that seduces the Lord's servants to commit adultery and eat things sacrificed to idols. And committing adultery is just you have a substitute husband. Maybe you think that is Christ, but it doesn't bring you into rest. He holds himself at arm's length and then becomes to you a journey of requirements that you have to fulfill before you can ever get whatever it is he supposedly offers. That's not Christ. Christ is immediate, available, and now. Christ is today if you will enter into his rest. Today is the day of salvation. Christ is only here for me today. Yesterday is gone. And tomorrow is not promised. Now he's there in my tomorrow. And he's there in my yesterday. But for me, my experience is about today. And by the way, that is the, also the key to understanding Hebrews. Hebrews is talking about where are you today. Okay, it is an experiential book for today. <laughs> but anyway, um, I thought, you know, what about these idols and what was behind it? You know, why did I get sucked into the prosperity thing? There was a spirit behind that, and it manipulated me and flattered me and guilted me all at the same time, because I knew that the prosperity message was wrong. I, I got saved. I, went to, I eventually went to this charismatic church because someone told me, you have to go to church, and I felt guilty because I wasn't going to church, so I went to church, and I found a place that really seemed to have the presence of God and an evangelical spirit and a prophetic spirit. And I was like, yes, but they had this prosperity message, which I wasn't into at the time. I didn't want to be like these, uh, prayer breakfast warrior, uh, men's rotary club association guys that were also successful. I was just a poor musician living in an apartment with a roommate, you know, barely afford rent, barely afford to put gas in my car. Not that that's good. I'm just saying that that's where I came from. I came from the city. I, you know, uh, and I knew there was, I used to make fun of televangelists. I knew that that was fake, but here's the thing. Because I respected the authority at that church and they were big on authority. I opened myself up to listen to all of their messages and every word they said, and they regular preached, regularly preached prosperity, and then stigmatize those that disagree. You know, at that time, Hank Hanegraaff was a big radio phenomenon. And they would regularly talk about Hank Hanegraaff and these heresy hunters that would go after Joyce Meyer and go after, you know, Kenneth Kagan and Kenneth Copeland. And, you know, I'd rather shine a light in the darkness than, uh, you know, curse the darkness and and they would castigate them as negative. And I don't like Hank Hanegraaff, but they castigated discernment and made it sound like if you didn't agree with what the pastor was saying, you were not right with God. Again, substituting being right with the pastor for the blood. Now the pastor is an idol. I mean, it is amazing how this, how subtly the enemy works. So, I was seduced by fear, intimidation, and promises, and carrots, and sticks, and flattery. You know, I mean, 
God wants to do something with you. God wants to use you, but he's got to bless you so that you can be a blessing. And don't talk about this message because this is from the Bible and this is the pastor and he's God's authority. Woe to those who would speak against him. So you're getting this message of guilt, condemnation, and fear while getting a message of flattery that says God really wants to use you if only you'll lay hold of this thing I'm teaching. Okay? <laughs> that is a spirit. Behind that is a spirit. That's not just a false teaching. There is a spirit behind that. Jezebel seduces my servants and she has saturated the church. Jezebel is the mother and the hus uh, wife of Antichrist. It's just the alternate side of Satan. It's the female side who uses not just brute force, but flattery, manipulation, bribery, ta all kinds of tactics to guilt you. And it's an extremely powerful spirit. When Elijah, after he had the showdown with Jezebel and the prophets, hid in that cave and wanted to die. Where did that come from? You're like, oh, well, he just fell into unbelief. No, he was being attacked by a spirit. Believe me, I know. That spirit is strong. That's why in Thyatira, the reward to the overcomers who overcome that spirit <laughs> is that they will sit on the throne with Christ and rule the nations with a rod of iron. It is the training ground to be a king, is to overcome that thing. And every time I got waylaid uh, in the wilderness, right as I was getting to the good land and the enemy put up a bunch of idols to capture my attention, making me think that that's what I needed to be able to get in, there was always this same pattern of shame, condemnation, intimidation, flattery, manipulation, people having dreams, people falsely prophesying, people accusing, and sleepless nights where my conscience had no rest and I thought God was angry at me. And I mean, it went on for years. So that's how I got roped into the prosperity thing. It was, I didn't even want to pray for a house. My wife wasn't buying into it. You know, uh, she wanted that. And the thing is, is that the pastoral system a lot of times will get the obedience of the wife and then, or your, or the husband, and split the marriage in half. They usurp the authority in the marriage so that you've got a divided household working against you too. I mean, this is, this spirit works from every angle at once, okay? Then, uh, eventually... You know, I had this Bible study where all the people I'd led to the Lord started showing up at this Bible study because somebody committed suicide, long story. Well, hold on a second. The, the pastor um, thought that these people were his fruit, even though I'm the one who brought them to the church. They wouldn't be, be at his church if I hadn't led them to the Lord, but he looked at them as his fruit and looked at it like I was sheep stealing, and someone accused me of trying to start a church in his church. And we were studying Ephesians, and I got to Ephesians 4 where the Gifted ones are given for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, and it's the w saints that do the work of the ministry. And I was talking about how the pastoral system paralyzes the body of Christ. And that got back to him. And that began three more years of threats from the pulpit, people having dreams, people prophesying, people, uh, my friends turning against me, people lying, just saga after saga, while my conscience is just in fear and trembling, and I think God's mad at me, and I think they're right, and I'm a false prophet, and I gotta submit. And again, the blood was not the solution. Submitting to the authority was. That's when you got an idol. Whenever Christ is presented to you, but the blood is not the way to deal with your conscience, but some method of cleaning things up, submitting to the authority, uh, getting part of some movement, whatever, you're dealing with an idol. And there's a spirit behind it. And she pukes all over you. And it's extremely powerful. And it wipes you out. I did not know this was a spirit. I thought all these people having the dreams and everything were... That was probably the Lord giving them supernatural insights to stay away from me and that I wouldn't be able to be in the fellowship until he cl I cleaned things up and submitted. So I tried to submit for years. 
And eventually I realized there's no home for me here. There's no, you know, and that's when I started reading Luther and everything and started getting more clear on justification by faith and started learning to apply the blood. Well then, watch me knee. You know, if you want Christ, and I did, you want Christ, the best way to have him is the proper church life, according to the New Testament pattern. Come join us. <laughs> so I did. And that was 10 years of even more intense accusations and subtle movements and people getting these impressions and weird ideas and supernatural stuff and shame and condemnation and guilt and flattery. It started out as love bombing. You're going to start a revival here. You're going to revive this whole church. In fact, you already have. You are from heaven. Thank you. You know, thank God for him. Then after a few months, well, the honeymoon's over. This guy, you know, and then, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. But then when it was time to leave, that wicked spirit really came out because I literally said, I need to take a weekend off and just clear my head. And the whole church blew up. It was like I had, they, and again, it was the same accusations. He's divisive. He's unloving. He doesn't care about the brothers. He doesn't care about all of us who've paid a price for him. He is following an angel of light. He's following a minister. He's following Satan. Uh, because I said, I need to fast and get clear. Oh no, that's dangerous. You can't fast by yourself. You know, uh, you, you're, you, you are being picked off. You're going to lose your anointing. I got emails from the elders that were copied to the whole church saying, uh, you know, that the house was cleaned up after the demon um, was cast out. And then the seven more demons came and the state of that man was worse than at the beginning. And they all prognosticated and prophesied all kinds of evil stuff on me because I hadn't even said I was leaving. All I wanted to do was take a weekend off because things were getting so crazy. And they said I was trying to start a church because once again, I had a Bible study with people I had led to the Lord and it was healthy and the church wasn't. And I couldn't bring my Bible study group to the church because I couldn't explain to them why they were all Chinese without getting deep into some doctrinal stuff that they weren't ready for. And it just blew up. And, and that whole thing, uh, the agony of that was five years in the making and three or four years after the event. It literally blew my marriage up, blew my household up, I ended up with nothing and feared that God was angry at me. That spirit kept plaguing me for another couple of years of fear that I would be in the outer darkness, weeping and gnashing our teeth because that was the doctrine that I wasn't an overcomer, that God could not use me, etc. Okay. So again, it's a spirit behind the mirage. It is a spirit behind the idol. And I keep dealing with it again and again and again, you know, well, then, um, you know, my, my whole life fell apart and I got married again, uh, which, you know, in hindsight, we shouldn't have done, but the Lord has been merciful to us because we were neither of us in good enough standing to make good decisions. Our conscience, we were both in a place where we had both been attacked this way in, in different situations and were completely wiped out and couldn't even read our Bibles anymore because it was all condemnation, you know. Um, and that led us to make some bad decisions. It was about 10 years ago. And then we got married and we went from church to church trying to find a church we'd agree on. But then we discovered, oh my gosh, we are spiritually on two totally different pages. I was now a grace person, at least doctrinally, but I didn't know how to rest. And she didn't quite understand where I was coming from. And grew up in the institutional church. So we went to several more of these institutional churches and each one blew up. And each time it was like this. And she was like, what is this? What have I married? It created such a huge problem in our marriage. It's only been in the last couple of years that we finally come to rest in our marriage and an agreement that Dave doesn't do the institutional church. You know, it's clear that he's got a prophetic thing and it's clear that the spirit attacks him. <laughs> she can see that too because she's she knows, you know. We went to counseling when our marriage was really falling apart because of all this stuff. And the, path, the, the counselor was like, when I told him my story and everything, he's like, you know, I just think 
you know, this is because because I was trying to get help for my religious issues. I was tired of being Martin Luther. I was tired of fighting all the time. Tired of always being in these attacks. And I thought it might be something wrong with me. That's what we were led to believe was it was something wrong with me. But I do this. This is what I do. Well, the counselor said, um, no, this is what happens to prophetic people. Your eyes are wide open and you see really clearly and it offends people. And I mean, hearing your story, I'm amazed that you're clear. And at the, after that, it was like, you know what? Th there's no helping this. This is who I am. And that's what he was trying to get me to do. Just accept who you are. The Christianity, they, they're, they're gone off the deep end, you know? And I think that that was the final deliverance when that a spirit couldn't attack me anymore. I mean, I, we went to a reformed church and the spirit attacked me there. I got kicked out, had the same guilt and everything. The enemy tried to use my, to pit my marriage, put us against each other and all this stuff, you know, shame, condemnation, fear of losing my salvation. Then we went to another church where I uh, said, I'm done being that person. I'm not going to fight anymore. So they had me sign a membership covenant, which I didn't agree with. And I thought, well, I'll just cross my fingers and sign it, even though I knew that that meant I was lying and agreeing to things I would never do, like tithing. I didn't agree with tithing. I knew if I put myself under the tithe, I put myself under the entirety of the law. No, I'm not doing that. But by signing the covenant, I knew I'm playing a game and everything I've been through is for vain and I'm doing it to just keep the peace and I'm going to put a smile on my face and pretend. Well, that quenched my spirit. And then that led me to the place where I had a, the biggest fall, and that was six years ago, and I don't need to get into all that. And finally, the Lord delivered me, you know, and brought me to rest through the blood of Jesus Christ. I was always trying to make peace with my situations through another means. You know, if I can just make my wife happy and have a good marriage, then the Lord will use me. If I can go to a church and finally be accepted, then the Lord can use me, you know. Then I can enjoy Christ. It was always something I had to do before I could enjoy Christ, not the blood. And finally, when I failed so bad that there was nothing left I could do, the blood was my only hope. And I thought I was good. I, I, I went back and had to rebuild the foundation of, am I really even saved? You know, that's when the grace started really shining because the blood, the spirit bears witness to the blood, the blood and the water go together. If you focus on blood by faith, you'll get water. It's that simple. What does the blood secure for you? Start exercising your faith in that and you'll get the water. You're thirsty, you're dry. Don't try to correct anything. Don't try to fix your situation. Don't try to change anything. Don't think about tomorrow and don't think about yesterday. Think about right now. Christ is available to me by the blood of Jesus Christ. And he's in my spirit and I'm in him. And start meditating on that kind of reality and singing it to him until you get the, the bubbling up of the living water in you. And it'll wash you and refresh you. And you won't be tempted by... You see, Jezebel can't tempt you when you are satisfied. She tempts you when you're dissatisfied and you think there's some other way, you know. So now I'm back in uh, my life and YouTube has come up, right? Uh... I, this time, knew what that spirit was. I'd studied quite a lot now. I knew what I was dealing with. I knew how to recognize when it was moving, and I could almost predict when it was going to happen. Sure enough, that spirit is moving quite rampantly in the YouTube community. And everybody, every time I talk about it, people think I'm accusing them. They come out of the woodworks and say, he's describing me. No, I'm talking about a spirit. But if you're not presenting Christ who is secured by the blood and available as the spirit, then you're presenting something else and you're being, you're actually part of the problem. And you might not be operating in that spirit, but that spirit is using that so-called ministry along with many others to bring people into bondage. You know, uh, so what can I say? How can I not, point out, look, th this is not a game. You can't keep exposing yourself to things that put something between you and Christ and or substitute Christ with something else and not get burned. Okay, there's a spirit behind that. 
It brings people into oppression and condemnation and weakness and fear. Or it brings them into a network of zealous people with pitchforks who are stirred up by this spirit through flattery. Either way, you don't want to be part of that crowd. You want, by the blood of Jesus, to suffer outside the camp, bearing his reproach, coming to him alone, individually, believing in Jesus Christ and what he's established for you. Then, as you enjoy that, you can go back in, but now you are a vessel of living water to set people free. You're not there to drink what they've got. You're there to supply them with what you have. And you will be persecuted. Just expect it. But who cares? <laughs> you know, the people who are clear can see what's going on. The people who are not, they may not see what's going on for a while. You know, the, really what it comes down to is you know, supposedly there's a big division and a war and all that stuff. No, there's another gospel. There is another, there are other things being presented in the place of Christ. Some people are attracted to those things and don't think they don't realize what's behind it. So they're just not clear. And I have nothing against any of them. I see a lot of them that, that used to listen to me that are now listening to other people and they just don't know what's going on. They're confused, you know, and I get it, but the Lord will take care of them. He is their shepherd. But yeah, it's a spirit that seduces you to idols. You would not naturally go to these idols. I would not naturally uh, start listening to prosperity teachings unless I was manipulated into it. I wouldn't naturally think I was a false prophet unless I was manipulated into it. I wouldn't naturally go join a church where we're the only Caucasians and spend 10 years being abused there willingly at the cost of my own marriage unless we were manipulated into it. Now, I was manipulated into it because I was in unbelief about the blood of Christ and thought I needed something else to satisfy my conscience. That's all it is. The only difference between me today and me back then is that, is that now I have the faith and my faith is set on the blood of Christ and not on something else. I've been made clear through all these different experiences. And, you know, and I'm not saying that there aren't things I could fall into again. I don't know. But I know this. I'm fighting that no one's going to steal my crown. You know, I'm complete in Christ. I have everything I need in him. You got nothing for me. I don't need you. I don't need your ministry. I don't need anything from you. Unless you're confirming with me and running along with me in the good land with our armor on rejoicing in Christ. Then we need Christ and we supply him to each other. We don't need each other. We need Christ and we supply him to each other. Hope that makes sense. Take care.